favorites. If you're a guy, you know what I'm talking about, gladiator, right, guys? That'd be a, a time for a Tim Two, two Man Taylor, you know what I'm saying? Uh, gladiator, uh, Braveheart, Saving Private Ryan, the 13th Warrior, the Patriot. I watched Patriot last night. Who likes the Patriot here? All the men? Now listen, ladies. <laughs> ladies, raise your hand. Listen, ladies, I go through the chick flick. I went to go see a walk to remember with my wife. I went to go see Blind Side with my wife. I go see all these chick flicks with my wife, the notebook. I sat right through that thing the whole time, eating popcorn, holding hands with my bride. I go do those. But I made my wife go see Braveheart with me years ago. And I can remember sitting in the theater, and my wife looked at me and said, Christian, is anybody else going to lose their head? I was like, oh, so good. <laughs> this is great. And I'm just loving it. My wife is hating it. And I remember this one part where they won this big victory. This is the true story about how these farmers basically picked up these pitchforks and won freedom for Scotland against this big army in England. Okay, and so here's these farmers fighting. They win this first victory, and they go to this big castle where all the rich noble people are just kind of partying and drinking their wine and eating all their food. And William Wallace, who was played by Mel Gibson, he looks at them and he realizes that they're just going to stop fighting after one victory. They've had one victory, and they're just going to stop. And William Wallace turns to leave, and one of the guys said, So, William, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm going to fight the English. And he said, you cannot do that. Are you mad? You're going to get killed. And he said, why can I not do that? He said, you are so busy squabbling for the scraps of long chain's table that you've missed your cut. Give a right for something better. That's not bad for a redneck. <laughs> and I'm just drawn into this thing. I'm like, oh my goodness, this is great. And then all of a sudden, William Wallace turns to leave, and the soon-to-be king, Robert the Bruce, follows him outside because he's intrigued by his passion. And he says, Sir William, people aren't going to follow you and die for your cause. He said, they have too much land. They have too much nobility. They have too many titles. They have too much money. They're not going to lay that down for you. He said, they're not going to follow you for that. And William Wallace looks at him and said, people do not follow titles. They follow courage. They follow passion. And he said, if you would just lead them, he said, they would follow you. And then he said, something really cool. And then he said, so would I. Willing to relinquish his leadership to follow this young son to be king. He was trying to inspire him. And I'm telling you what, it jacked me up so much. I was in downtown Anderson, South Carolina. And I jumped to my feet and I said, and I would follow you too. <laughs> I mean, I screamed in the entire theater. And my wife jerked me back down by my shirt. She said, I cannot believe I am married to you. <laughs> and I looked at my wife and I said, Amy, I'm telling you, if I had a sword and a kelp, somebody would lose their head right now. I mean, I was so jacked up, I was ready to cut somebody's head off. I mean, how many of you can understand what I'm talking about when you see people get passionate, you get passionate, right? You know what I'm talking about? Because people are inspired by passion. People are inspired. They're, they're just inspired when they come to church and they see people worshiping God, when they see people carrying their Bibles, when they see people not only at church on Sunday, but living it out all week long, seven days a week, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, when people see passion on your face, they follow and they respond to your passion. You see, we come to churches today, and when I preach in churches, I'm telling you, I can watch Frozen Chosen is what some people call them. <laughs> Walking into the church doors, they kind of had this Eeyore complex, you know, Winnie the Pooh. I call it Eeyore Christianity. Oh, nobody loves me. <laughs> Why am I here? I'm not I'm going to have to wait in line when I go eat lunch. The pastor's going to preach over it. He's going to say the same story he said a year and a half ago. I mean, they, they complain all the time. They bring this negativity to the church. And it impacts people in such a negative way. Sometimes, by the way, you only have one shot at somebody's life. Let me tell you, when I started getting crazy with my faith, years ago when I was a youth pastor in Charleston, we had one girl that came to our youth group one night, and she was with four other people, and they were obnoxious. They talked. They disrupted the entire service. I separated them. I put the young girl over here. I said, girl, you need to listen to the gospel of Jesus Christ. This might be your only shot to hear about Jesus. Straighten up. And as I preached, at the end of the night, I gave an altar call. This girl came up and gave her life to Christ, jumped in the car with those four girls. They had a car accident. All of them lived with her, and she left. She lost her life. 
that night at 14 years old. Her grandfather came to me weeping at our church a couple of weeks later and said, thank you. I know that my granddaughter is in heaven today. And since that moment, man, I just go for it all the time because sometimes you only have one shot to let people see your passion. So I would encourage you, when you go to work, let people see your passion for Christ. When you are in your neighborhood, let people see your passion for Christ. I get aggravated when I look around and there's more cars in another parking lot because they're having a cookout. Like if I know that my neighbors that don't go to church, if they have a bigger cookout than me, I put it on the counter and say, baby, we're throwing a party we're right here. Why? I said, because they had four more cars in our last party and we're topping it. She's like, we don't have to compete like that. I'm like, yes, we do. We cannot be outdone by the world. We have to let people see that we have more passion for Christ than we have for the world. And that our passion can drive them to come and be a part of our party. And I know this. A lot of you ladies are looking at me like right now going, I can't believe I feel so sorry for your wife. Her name is Amy. You want to put her on the bridge. <laughs> but this is just how I live. As a matter of fact, not too long ago, I went to Wild Wings Bar and Grill. And I go there and eat a lot. One of my best friends, his name is Marcus, he used to have a, a number one R&B hit song years ago. Uh, in 2001, he opened up for Nelly, Will Smith. Uh, he was on the Jay Leno show, Soul Train. How many old school people remember the dance show? Soul Train, you remember that show? So he was on that show, and he had it made. And then he ended up getting hooked on this thing called crack cocaine. Almost lost his life. Went to a rehab in Columbia. Gave his life to Christ. Moved to Charlotte. Became a worship leader. And he is like one of my best friends in the world. One night, not too long ago, he calls me up. And he said, Christian, he said, let's go to Wild Wings Bar and Grill. I feel like singing tonight. And I'm like, what are you talking about, man? You're just going to take the mic and start singing. He said, that was karaoke night. And he said, I just feel like performing. I said, dude, it's 1130 at night. My wife's not going to let me go out with you. He said, come on, man. He said, I need the accountability. I don't want to go off and do anything stupid, so I just want to go sing and perform and then leave. And I said, well, let me ask my wife. I said, Amy, can I go hang out with Marcus at Wild Wings? No. I said, dude, it's not going to happen. He said, man, just ask her again. So I asked her again. And she said, Christian, you be home in an hour. Ain't nothing good going on at 12 o'clock after midnight for a married man. I said, all right, baby. I said, I'll, I'll be home. I said, let me go do this for and I'll come straight back. So I go to Wild Wings, and I remember this big black bouncer used to be like an NFL football player, owns his own security company. He does the bouncing there on Wednesday night. And he's a big guy. And he looks at me, and he knows I'm a pastor because I've been there with my wife before. You know, we go there sometimes on our date nights. And he looked at me, and he said, what you doing here, pastor? <laughs> he said, I know you ain't drinking, is you? And I said, nah, I'm not doing that, man. I said, I'm just chilling out with my boy. I'm going to listen to him singing, and I'm going home. He said, go have some fun, doctor. I'll check you later, baby. I know you're straight. And so I go in, I sit down, order me some wings. Marcus gets up and sings this song about Brian McKnight. And he's a white guy, man, but he's got like this phenomenal voice. Sounds just like Brian McKnight. He sings this song. All the people go crazy. He sits back down. I got chicken sauce on my face. I'm like, that's my boy. I mean, I'm just having a good time. Then all of a sudden, he looks at me and he said, man, why don't you do a Snoop Dogg, Dr. Dre rap song? I was like, no. He said, you know, man, when you do these conferences, you, you take Snoop Dogg lyrics and you change them and you put Christian lyrics to them. He said, why don't you go bust it up for Jesus? I said, dude, you didn't sing no hymn, no. I said, you want me to go rap Snoop Dogg for Jesus? I said, sit there and eat your wings, boy. We're going to leave. I got to go home. He said, man, where's your passion? Where's your leadership? He said, man, we can have church in here. He said, come on, baby. Walk on water. I've heard that sermon. Get out the boat, Peter. He was screaming at me in the restaurant. And I'm like, all right, let's do it. So I called my wife up and I said, baby, I'm getting ready to rap Snoop Dogg. She said, don't do it. Come home. I said, wake the kids up and pray. I said, we're going for it. We're going to see what God can do. So I get up to the microphone. And the karaoke guy looks at me. He said, what you doing tonight, Tim bro? What you got going on, big country? And I said, you would think that, man. I said, but I'm going to rap Snoop Dogg, Dr. Dre, nothing but a G thing. He said, are you drunk? <laughs> I said, I probably should be to pull this off. I said, no, I'm not. I said, matter of fact, don't even put the words up. I got my own lyrics. He said, what are your lyrics? I said, I'm going to rap about Jesus. He said, man, don't do that. <laughs> he said, this is the craziest crowd we've had in like three months. He said, I would not do that tonight. They're going to rip you to pieces. I mean, it was like 300 people in this place. Passed out, making out, drunk, about to fight outside. I mean, I guarantee you there are people selling reefer in there. I mean, it was absolutely insane what was going on. So I get up to the microphone, I said, I'm going to rap Snoop Dogg, Dr. Dre, nothing but a G thing. And this dude on the front row with a shot glass and a Budweiser, he stood up and he said, bring your game, Snoop Dogg. <laughs> and I 
looked right at him and I said, yeah, this is my game, baby. I said, this is Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre, not high on West Coast Reefer, but high on Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. And he literally looked at his beer like, what am I drinking? And he sat back down. He started looking around at the crowd. I mean, people quit making out the drunk dude set up and went, what? I mean, it was absolutely insane. And I'm a nervous wreck. I look and Marcus is hiding behind me. I'm like, dude, where's my support? And so the beat kicks in and I go straight into my Snoop Dogg voice. And I have no idea how this happened because I was raised in the country. In Canapolis, it's like, one, two, three, two, three, four. Snoop Dogg is talking about the drainers at the top, ready to make an entrance and step on up. Because what I tell you makes you want to jump.